big season for women's college basketball. And now we get to see the WNBA reap the rewards of uh, what we've seen ratings-wise with Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and others going pro. Um, Chad, the one thing we haven't been watching, I haven't really even thought about, is the NBA. Is that spell disaster when it comes to the postseason, which they're just on the, you can see the postseason on the horizon for the league. I, no I don't. I don't talk to many people who are really into the NBA. I, I'm, I'm being completely honest. This is not regional bias or, or anything like that. I think the only person I really follow on Twitter right now that's into the NBA is Ben Stiller. Uh, and if you wow. follow Ben Stiller, the comedian, actor, director, writer, all he posts about is New York Knicks basketball. <laughs> it's hilarious. I mean, it is up to the minute, just blow by blow content on the Knicks night to night. So that's how I get my NBA content. And, of course, Charles Barkley and Inside the NBA is entertaining. Is the league entertaining? Hell no. Not, a, not from I like what that I show the most. Yeah. More than the game. I'd rather watch that show. I'd rather watch that show and not know what they're commenting on <laughs> because I didn't watch the games than actually watch the games. Now, will I flip the switch and watch some when the playoffs start? Yes. But it's really going to take a compelling story or a team to bring me in even to the playoffs. Maybe our Minnesota Timberwolves right. can be that team for us that we suddenly get behind and, and root for in the playoffs. But other than that, the NBA is not a great basketball product right now for a lot of America. And the ratings show that. NBA Finals a year ago averaged 11.65 million viewers throughout. That was down about 12% from the 2022 Finals. Just a little history of the least watched NBA Finals in the modern era. I'm considering the modern era, late 80s through 90s, through the aughts up to now, not when the finals were on tape delay, which was a thing. Even when Bird and Magic got into the league initially, the NBA Finals aired on tape delay late at night on CBS. So that was a different era for sure. But some of the least watched finals, 2020, the, the fewest people watched ever. That was the COVID year, the bubble year. The Lakers won it over the heat. An average of 7.45 million viewers per game. 2021, notice a trend here. 2021 and 2023, two of the least watched. 9.91 million on average. 2007, Spurs, Cavs. You're going to see the Spurs as a common denominator here. 9.86 million. And the least watched other than the COVID pandemic bubble year, 2003, 9.29 million watched the Spurs and the Nets that year. I'm looking at all these numbers, and I'm factoring in that 18.7 million Americans just watched Caitlin Clark and Iowa lose to South Carolina and for South Carolina to have their undefeated season. And it forces me, doesn't force me, it leads me to ask a question that I would have deemed preposterous just one year ago, before Caitlin Clark, the phenomenon that is Caitlin Clark, swept America. Could the WNBA Finals in a given year ever outrate the NBA Finals? Now, there's collective laughter for the audience right now, hearing that, saying there's no way possible. There's no way possible, Chad, because last year's WNBA Finals peaked at 1.3 million people watching. It averaged 758,000 viewers compared to a down year for the NBA, averaging 11.65 million viewers. I don't think you can compare WNBA to NBA when factoring this in. Because before Caitlin Clark and Iowa started to go on their run, I also would have thought it to be preposterous for anyone ever to argue that a women's college basketball national championship game would have more viewers than a men's game. And they blew the men's game out of the water this year with 18.7 million viewers. First time ever. First time ever the women's national championship game outrated and had more viewers than the men's game. Yes, one was on TBS, one was on ABC. But even if all things are equal, and this is a hypothetical I'm throwing out there. We'll post it on our Twitter account also and let people vote on it. If you had the perfect storm, like we just saw in the women's game in college, 
If it was Caitlin Clark in the Indiana Fever, I don't even know if they have conferences in the WNBA. I'm not sure how it works. But if it was that versus Angel Reese in the New York Liberty, let's say, or the Las Vegas Aces are the most watched WNBA team, I don't know. But put the right player or combination of players on that opposition versus Caitlin Clark. Could we ever see the WNBA Finals outrate the NBA Finals? I think it's a stretch. But this past spring and what we just saw, to me, Hutton, sort of changes expectations for what could be for both leagues. I don't see it happening because the WNBA Finals take place in October. That's a big problem. That's just, you know, the, the You'd June have to aspect. avoid all weekends. Well, you have to avoid Thursdays. Yeah. Thursday nights. You have to play the games Monday, Mondays, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday nights. It's not going to work for you. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to play your, your, your WNBA Finals are Tuesday, Wednesday. Maybe Friday. Uh, the playoffs are September and October for the WNBA. That's the detriment. And Well, since we're still playing hypothetical, what if they went head-to-head? What if both were in the middle of June? Well, if both And you were, had Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese. Or, or the, think LeBron of the, the, versus someone? No. The worst NBA Finals matchup you can remember. Suns-Bucks, two, 2021, 9.91 million, which were 2 million less than Heat Nuggets, which also it's a pretty bad TV matchup for the NBA Finals. Think of the worst possible market matchup you can have in the NBA. Would there ever be a scenario where head to head, I think it, the women could win? I think it matters uh, what Caitlin Clark's up to, what she's doing. Um, uh, the the whole hype around the, of course, Angel uh-huh. Reese matchup from not this past one, but the year prior in the final. Uh, then the season that followed where she broke the record and all the hype that followed, I think all that that matters. And the run through the tournament, you have the rematch. Uh, the numbers were big going into it, but you have the rematch. And there's a steady build from the yeah, second steady, round on. Steady build, steady build really from the, the regular season where she's breaking yeah. the record. Uh, without the record, though, what, what are the numbers? Without that, that draw to watch history, that, that, that's number one. And I do think, what the NBA lacks right now, Chad, they have their villain. I mean, Draymond Green will play your villain. Who's stepping up to do anything about that? Who's, who's the, the true face? Lebr- LeBron's going to be 40 years old in December. Steph Curry and Durant are all going to be 36, if not already this year, but by the end of the year. They have, I mean, they, they, the Denver Nuggets were the NBA Finals last year. They, relatively unknown. Right, it was. Uh, they're a great team. They have the great player, but a relatively uh, unknown for the average fan watching the NBA on a weekly basis. That's tuning in to watch the top playmakers and the faces of the league. You had people complaining about um, it, but Jokic being the the actual MVP of the league at the time. Um, that's that's what they lack. They lack that true, uh, not the star power. They have individual star power, but the the true. Uh, underdog story that, that that then becomes something that everyone's talking about and you feel like you're a part of the the trend as it's happening instead of finding out about a great show and then binging it for three seasons and waiting on season four so the, you see what i'm saying yes yeah and i want to i want to follow up on that so let's back up the, the truck a little bit on it what we saw this past year which was it is not was is a complete outlier and an anomaly in television ratings. And that is the women's game beating the men's game in the championship, in the Final Four, and for the national championship. Never seen it before. I still contend that's way more of a positive statement about Caitlin Clark and South Carolina and Angel Reese and everyone involved in the women's game in UConn in a great national semifinal on a Friday night. It's more a testament to them than it is a negative for men's college basketball. I don't think men's college basketball is in some horrible spot. No. Hutton, you said the NBA needs a villain. They've got that, though. The NBA's biggest problem right now is the villain is the play itself. But it's Is people watching the game, and they're all saying to themselves, boy, I wish they got after it more. Boy, I wish the yeah. games didn't look like this. That's the villain, but if you, and that's not helping them. But the villain 10 years ago was the super team. And the numbers were were large. If, if Miami is playing with the super superpowers uh, against Golden State, again, the Golden State is the version of Iowa at the time. 
you know, the, the, they were built from the ground up. They built through the draft. Steph Curry is an anomaly at the time. Now Steph Curry's all the rage and everyone's doing it. Like, it, it's, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's not, it's bandwagon, but you feel like you're watching it in real time instead of someone telling you about it a year ago. Um, and I, I also think, like, well, let's wait and see after Caitlin Clark's not on the television what these ratings look like. And, and, and then compare it to the worst NBA Finals matchup. I have no intention of watching the WNBA other than Caitlin Clark playing on that team. Period. Well, and, and that, look, that's why I asked the hypothetical because it only it, this is only a Caitlin Clark story. That's it. Like so it, it has to be. She has to be playing. The hypothetical has to be. And, and honestly, you're right. It can't be in October. They'd have to flip the seasons. But in this perfect world, I'm talking about where both the men's professional season and the women's end at the same time. Yep. And it's alternating nights. Would Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese in the WNBA Finals surpass a men's finals that, quite frankly, would have to be the all-time worst matchup from television market and interest from the fans? Could the WNBA surpass the NBA? I still think the answer is likely no. What would it be? What would but be the, the fact team? that we just saw something we've never seen, it really is shocking to me. What would be the matchup? Is it Charlotte versus, is it the Hornets? Uh, I mean, it would be like the, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks. But even Giannis there would help. Giannis is there. But it would, t- it would be, it'd take a good team to get there. So yeah. I'm trying to think of the good teams right now that could do it. You know, I mean, the Dallas Mavericks versus Grizzlies. the, um, uh, well, it, I think the Grizzlies are in the West too. Dallas oh, no, Mavericks. I'm, saying, I'm throwing out the teams that would be. Versus the Detroit ja. Pistons. Okay. I just, I mean, I. That, I, that would be one that maybe they could surpass. It used to be the New Jersey Nets, but Brooklyn brings a different appeal. When Charles Barkley and people that carry that much weight with their opinion on basketball, when everyone that covers the sport, Stephen A. Smith, mm-hmm. is saying that load management and the style of play and what they see across the league is making it a bad product, that's bad. Because these are people who are normally defenders of the brand, defenders of the sport. And when they're crushing it, y- you got a big problem. What is the remedy to that, though? It's not like the players are just going to give it back. There, there are some of the players are saying, "Hey, we need to the, the rules about you know sixty plus games, or you're not qualified to win an award." Like we need to lower that a little bit. Uh, they want it they three or four games less. They don't want to add games to it. Um, I, it's not going anywhere just based on the the NBA Players Association having the the agreement now for ten years with the CBA that's locked in, which is what the NBA wanted. They wanted that locked in to prove that there's not going to be a, a, um, a labor issue with the new television contract, which they're, they now can guarantee based on the 10-year agreement with the, the, the PA. So they're using that to their advantage for television rights. So they locked into it that way. I, I just uh, I don't know how to remedy it based on the, the egos of the individuals. To me, there's not a professional league that treats their fans worse than the NBA. Uh, that, that treats them with, with as much disdain as the NBA does. And well, it, it's it's almost like a weird symbiotic relationship with those that are on social media that just tout the NBA at all times, that they love the abuse but, but the, but they take it, from players. It's not, the, it's not the local team that you're a fan of that's treating you that way. It's the team on the road that you're paying high dollar for uh, to see LeBron or whoever uh, play that night and they don't play because they're coming into your city. That That's the load management issue, especially I, I on back to back. I think the lack of effort, quite frankly, and the style that I see, I think it's a slap in the face to everyone. When I turn on a game and watch it, I think even if, you, if it's your team at home, the whole thing does not make me want to come back. It's it's almost like you know political divisions. Like if you're, if you're dug in right now and an NBA fan, you're, you're not leaving – and you're going to defend them at all costs, even though you see it with your own two eyes too, but you just don't want to admit it to yourself. Yeah, That's how far the NBA has fallen. In the eyes of the general sporting public. I, I truly believe this. Well, and now look, I'm going to give it a chance because I'm open-minded. I'll turn it on for the playoffs, and I'll come back here in two, three weeks and tell you if I was wrong, and then I'm seeing a lot of good basketball that's being played at a high level with a lot of defense. And if I can come back and say, you know, load management really paid off I'm glad they sacrificed that 82-game regular season because we've got a hell of a product now that the playoffs are here. I'll say that. I'm not going to, though, because I already know what it's going to look like. And it's not going to be good. 
Well, you said the the uh, what the team that used to be our Warriors, Chad. Uh, Are they out of the playoffs? No, now? they they clinched. They got the tenth oh, they did? seed, the tenth seed. Oh, the play in. That's and, right. And they were celebrating like they had just clinched the you know the Western Conference. Uh, they, they this is a, a franchise that we're used to clinching uh, recently, clinching by you know Christmas, <laughs> the uh, their their conference and the. I don't know, the celebration. I, I hate the champagne celebrations in baseball. There's too many of them in the locker rooms. Uh, this is a version of that for me. It was, it's just awkward. You're watching, a good, you're, you're celebrating the 10th the spot, locking that up. You haven't had it that hard. Draymond's been an idiot, but you haven't had it that hard. Well, it's, it's really unfortunate that someone can be such a giant jackass like Draymond Green that it forces me to root against who I consider to be good guys in Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. Because I, I love that Warriors team for you, years. Have you seen the commercial but with Draymond? Draymond Green is such a jackass in how he plays and how dirty he is and how he won't accept responsibility for anything. He's even joking about it in a commercial. It forces me to want them to lose quickly Yeah, because of that. They may. That's intense. And Steve Kerr, who I loved as a player – and love when he started out as a coach, he's complicit in all this because he doesn't put his foot down Well, they on anything. They trade away the other players. It's also, Hutton, going back to what you said, players aren't going to give it back. Why would you? Steve Kerr knows that. Well, now the, the moment would... Steve Kerr, if, if he decided to be a disciplinarian at this point, right. they'd probably just vote him off the island and he'd be fired. Um, so we've got plenty to get to. The Masters, though. It's Masters Week, Chad. Does it feel like Masters Week to you? No. It, me either. Me either. And it, maybe it's just the weather. Uh, the weather, uh, they've got the par three going on now. Uh, of course, uh, teeing off things tomorrow. Tiger plays in the morning. And the fact that Tiger Woods is playing has me pumped. I, I want to appreciate the fact that one of the greatest of all time in any sport of our era, uh, I, I'm not sure that we would have... I'm not sure Michael Jordan would be doing this. I'm not sure Tom Brady, who went through a career without much issues with injury at all, would be doing this. What Tiger's been going through with the spinal fusion, the car accident, everything else in between, and the fact that he continues to show up to events like this, looking to compete, saying, saying at the podium he's there to compete, uh, I'm, I respect the hell out of that. Because you know... That, I mean, it would be embarrassing for me, and I can only, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to break 90 on a, on a good day. Here's a guy that has the highest of highs with expectation for his game, and he can barely get around the golf course, and he knows that's hindering his overall ability. There's no question about it. But yet he continues to go through the rehab, the cold tubs, all the, the massage therapy, stretching. Uh, he's playing in the morning. There's no telling what time he has to get up to get ready for that round. And then if he, luckily for us, hopefully, knock on wood, if he gets through the round, he's got the afternoon. And then the turnaround, if he, you know, fingers crossed, makes the cut, the morning tee time on Saturday has to be brutal. And more likely than not, he's probably going to withdraw from the tournament. And we have this guy on display knowing that he had the win in 2019 who's not just willing to go out on that. He's willing to show up and, and willing to do what I think is not just for the fans, but he's doing it for himself to prove a point. I think uh, we, we had a great chat yesterday. Maybe he's doing it for his son Charlie to show an example. Maybe. I think he's doing it to compete, and he's competing with himself and his body that's breaking down. Here's Tiger discussing that. Again, about your physicality, the pain you're under, is it a constant when you're out there on the course? Is it worse here? And are you playing with, playing with painkillers? Uh, I hurt every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, is, yes. Is I, 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 I ache. No, I, I ache every day. And um, I, I prefer it warm and humid and hot. And uh, I know we're getting some thunderstorms. So at least it'll be hot. It won't be like last year. So I, I'm, I'm hearing that. I'm watching and seeing, you know, he's barely getting around the course the last time we saw him, and then he, all of a sudden he's sick, quote-unquote. I, uh, 
Chad, I, I respect this because of who he is and the face of the sport he represents. And the fact that everybody continues to want to see him despite it not being Tiger, Tiger, Tiger Woods, y'all. You know what I mean? It's just Tiger trying to get through the round and hopefully make a cut. But honestly, if he just gets through two, two rounds walking around this course, I'm thrilled with it because I can't wait to tune in on this, the, the online feed and just follow his group because it's him. And it's not just some honorary tee-off, which eventually will be him. Yeah, and Bob Herrick, who we had on yesterday, you mentioned what he said about Tiger maybe doing this to show an example to Charlie on how to compete even when you don't feel great or how to push through pain and do things like that and overcome adversity. That's an interesting idea that I, I had not thought about. It's also, it's not like it's a team sport. Right. It's not like Tiger Woods needs to show up for a team and he gets paid a ton of money by an organization to show up. So he's just finishing out his contract and he's going to be there for the team and play his role and do what he needs to do and play through pain in order to fulfill his obligation to the team. His only obligation and all these golfers only obligation, they're an independent contractor in the PGA. Their obligation is to themselves. It's an individual sport. So Tiger Wood, Tiger Woods has every right to stop, yeah. to just go to his mansion in Florida to not to ride around in a golf cart on his property if he wants, just for the sheer embarrassment, like yeah, just to, the, to hang out with ego, his kids. You know, that, I, I think about the greatest in their sports and whether or not they would do this if they'd hobble around and look it's sometimes really bad. Uh, yeah. He's always going to have a great round of golf. It's Tiger Woods. I'm just saying, like, versus who he was and knowing that you don't want to go out that way. If Brady tore his ACL, I'm not sure after the Super Bowl win. Two years later, he's sticking around to prove a point. Yeah. He went out anyway. Same thing with Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers wants to prove a point to Green Bay. And Tiger's got nothing to prove. He's coming back off the Achilles injury. But do you think Rodgers is sticking around if he goes and wins the title like, like you witnessed yeah. in person in 2019? No. Uh, Woods is. I wonder if it has something to do with his son, the way Bob told us, uh, and why he wants to keep doing it. Uh, the guy loves golf. I mean, there's there's no doubt. He's, he's a historian of the game. He loves it. it. It's it's in his core. It's every fiber of his being consists of golf throughout his yeah, life. And yeah. that that's what he knows, and it's what he and loves. competition. But, yeah, I mean, the, the pull to have as much money as Tiger Woods currently has, knowing that you've been physically through what he's been through. Right. And as he said in his own words, and you just heard it, I hurt. I hurt every day. I prefer it to be hot and humid, and it's going to be rainy with thunder showers. To not want to just go binge Netflix shows at home and sit on a couch and be comfortable and hang out with your kids and, and, and do that part of your life and not the competition part. Well, he can, It is commendable in a lot of ways. He can still keep all his endorsements. It's, I think it's crazy to 95% of people. He's got his new, br uh, new brand. Because most people aren't built like Tiger Woods. He's worth over a billion dollars. Right. <laughs> I mean, and most people aren't built like Tiger Woods. Because right. I, I hear that, well, I'm I don't thinking, know, but why I don't would know, you do that? I don't know if the elite of the elite are built like this, though. No. Uh, maybe Jordan. Maybe Jordan. You think LeBron's doing this? I don't. I mean, again, like, just in our, in our lifetime, think about the athletes that would actually do this. And I, I'm looking from the fan perspective, this is awesome. Because he's still doing it. It's not like we, we had 2019, and you have to put that in perspective. In 2019, we're thinking, oh, he's coming back. Like, here we go. And we now we see him like this, and he's still willing to, to go out there and, and, and put on a show. It's a show at this point, and I'm here for it. I need the next Tiger Woods. I, I love this. I love that we still get to watch him compete. Well, we may see him. Even if he's not really competing. Scheffler. I, but I just, I, I need, it, it, I'm not talking just golf. In general. Like, who is... Who are we going to point to and say, this is Brady, this is Jordan, this is Tiger. This is a guy who's such a dogged competitor. You can never kill him. Is it Patrick Mahomes right now? Maybe. Uh, is it going to be Joe Burrow? Maybe. I mean, there are examples in the NFL that we can point to and say, maybe this guy becomes that dude that just wins when you don't think they're going to win because they have such an F you mentality. Yes. I'm watching the Brady Patriots documentary. And Brady echoes something that Hutton and I have used for years. He uses the acronym FEA, which stands for F them all. 
And that was the mentality when he came back from the suspension. And that EA, the um all, included Jimmy Garoppolo on his own team. Yes. Who he was bound and determined to destroy. And he told teammates that while Garoppolo was starting those four games, he was suspended. And on camera, he says the exact same thing. He says, no one effing wants us to win, so F-E-A. That was my mentality all year. They already want us to lose. That's Jordan. That's Brady. That's Tiger Woods. I love that mentality. I, I hope we get more of it. I, I just I don't know who in that next generation right. Who's the Brett is going to be that. I thought it was going to be Jordan Spieth for a while. The way he started his career – and to watch him screaming at himself yep. over the course of a round, I'm thinking, this is going to be the guy. I'm thinking of Happy Gilmore. Here comes the putter throw you know, with, with Jordan Spieth, that he would just uh, be that angry and that type of dude. He's, yep. he's not become that. Yep. I want to see more of that. Chad, uh, John Calipari has become the new head coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks. $7 million per year. Uh, has he called the Hogs yet? Uh, I'm sure he has. Come on. All right, I got to see. Remember I said, I think that it was, was around of... 2 p.m. Central, 3 Eastern. No, I, I predicted he would be calling the Hogs. Oh, I, I think he has by now, based on your prediction. He's called it I've seen times. photos of him arriving in, in northwest Arkansas in an Arkansas colored shirt. The, this, well, the, uh, the whole storyline now switches to Kentucky. But from the Kentucky perspective and the Calipari perspective, the breakup. You're reading the article at the Athletic, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of input from some college coaches, including Tom Izzo, Rick Barnes, uh, who were very open and honest about their perspective of Calipari. What does it dig into on where the split actually occurs with Calipari, Kentucky, and why it got to this point? Not with the fan base, but with the internal strife. Yeah, really good reporting done by The Athletic. It was Sham Sharania, Sharania the NBA reporter, yeah. and one college reporter that they cooperated on this story. But it really stems back to, if everyone will remember, we talked about on this show, when Calipari down in the Bahamas mm. had reporters over because he was pissed off about not getting the new basketball-only facility he wanted built. And he made the comment that it's a basketball school, after all. With all due respect to everyone else, it's a basketball school. Well, if you remember, Mark Stoops, the football coach, went ballistic over those comments. Mitch Barnhart didn't like it. Mitch Barnhart had to call a press conference to basically try to make good with everyone, and he dropped a line in there that, you know, basketball will always be supported, but coaches, they come and go. People that know Calipari said it was over then. The divorce had begun that moment. When he made that comment, he was not allowed to apologize he wanted to issue sort of a very carefully constructed apology where he doesn't admit being wrong or doesn't admit fault with what he said or that he was wrong in saying that, but apologizing to Mark Stoops. They wouldn't allow that at the time, and the divorce really started at that point. And John Calipari told people he should have left Kentucky in 2019 when he, did, when he had the opportunity to take the UCLA job, that he knew maybe his time was coming to an end there and they needed a new voice. He says yesterday... They need a new voice, specifically with Arkansas. Friday night before the Final Four, this past weekend, okay. he's in Phoenix with every other coach, and the head of Tyson Foods, a uh, Tyson, a member of the Tyson family, not Mike Tyson, Tyson Foods, um, awesome. Tyson Foods and Hunter Juracek, the AD at Arkansas, they meet with Calipari in his suite. This is the classic story of I went to a guy to try to get his opinion on who we should hire, and it turned out we all shook hands and said, man, we should hire him. That should be the one. I feel like they knew maybe they could get Calipari when they went to meet with him, but they spent an hour in his hotel suite, and they were just asking Calipari about different coaches. And then when they left, Juracek turns to Tyson and says, why not just hire him? I think we just met with a guy that should be the next head coach at well, Arkansas. He's buddies with. And then they got the ball rolling. Tom Mars, who is sure, John Calipari's. I'm sure that's how it went down. Yeah, Tom Mars, who we've had on the show, <laughs> is Calipari's attorney. Tom Mars is an Arkansas law school graduate. Yep. So okay. they, they, they claim it was 15 minutes of negotiations is what it took. They would send over an offer sheet. Calipari would say, this is good, this is good, let's work on this, let's make sure that I'm guaranteed this. Give me and an then before you know it, well, he's leaving Kentucky. But, but then there's the report, though, that he took that offer to Kentucky to try to match it. It wasn't a match. It was... Here's what I have. Here's my value. Yeah. I, it's leverage. I don't way. have the story right in front of me, but the wording from Gabriel 
Dick Gabriel had the report. Yes. And, and through Kentucky Sports Radio, too, was something like he took the offer to Kentucky to, to basically try to get what he wanted from Kentucky. And I honestly think what he wanted from Kentucky was reaffirmation that you are the guy for the job, Cal. We want you here long term. We sign you to a long term contract. We believe in you. And instead, what he got from Mitch Barnhart was more of the same attitude that he's had from Mitch Barnhart ever since he burned that bridge with the football program. It was, no, leave. This is yeah. good. This is a good time to split. You should take this job. And that made the decision easy for Calipari. So is, uh, is this Because it totally... didn't match. He's making less. He's making $7 million a year at Arkansas. He's making $2 million so, less than he so was Kentucky at Kentucky. So Kentucky will owe him something because it's offset language. I don't know that they owe him anything because he left on his own. This oh, isn't a firing so they didn't in fire the him, So they don't owe him anything. If they he, don't owe if him anything. Left. Okay. Which again, well, this maybe is that kinda, led to why they he he was able to I, show the offer. I admire the hell out of that with John Calipari. Yeah. In a world that too often is just simply about the bottom line, I will go here for one dollar more, or I will not do this for one dollar less. John Calipari wow. left a lifetime contract on the table because he did not feel supported. He felt like they needed a new voice. And he left a place that he was at for 15 years and left a ton of money out there to go work somewhere else. Not to retire, to take a job and go work somewhere else. I've never been John Calipari's biggest fan. I am a fan of that move by him. It makes me respect the guy a lot more. Let's break down this move a bit more, too, because he makes the comment basketball school in the Bahamas. Arkansas just made a move that makes them a basketball program. They're a basketball school. They were playing. They were paying Musselman four million. Now they're paying Calipari seven. And they've guaranteed and seven to nine million dollars in it, NIL money a year for the for their their roster. They're now a basketball school. Bye bye Sam Pittman, who's already on the hot seat. You know, like that. That's what I. That's what I see, or I think through the commitment to the. You've got Calipari, who's running athletics now. He's the face of Arkansas athletics. And it's not going to be uh, the football program. I think given... given it, Just rewind two years and look at what Arkansas football was doing. You know, Right. Well, Arkansas basketball is certainly a thing. Oh, they... I mean, they, they were right there they with have Kentucky their in the 90s uh, when Nolan Richardson was there. So they're very, very good. But no one's mentioning the top coaches at Arkansas whenever Musselman leaves. I think Arkansas can just be both. Well, they have the money and the resources to be both. But they haven't been doing both. With the money and the resources. I don't think it's for lack of effort, although I will say the whole Pittman coming back decision yes. and running it back is a little bit baffling. But I feel and like they, they bring try. In Petrino. They bring back I think Bobby everybody Petrino. just knows it's a really difficult job. Sure. Yeah. Football especially. And Basketball, you can get good quick. The, uh, Football's the, a little tougher. Now, now, Kentucky. So Calipari makes the – this is a basketball school, with all due respect. And then we see this happen. Now what does Kentucky do at the coaching spot? We, we certainly know who has uh, made statements and taken their name out of the running. Um, Scott Drew so reportedly met with them. They were, Kentucky called Scott Drew almost immediately after making things official through Calipari. We know they've been talking before, prior to this. Uh, but that's the report, right? That's the story. Um, but Chad, you passed along this morning. Scott Drew's um, hanging out in Waco with a big supporter of Baylor Athletics. Yeah, he's posting a photo at some uh, little breakfast joint with the head of uh, Alliance Bank, Eric Shiro. And he's obviously a big donor of Baylor Athletics. And uh, other than the odd shoulder touch in the photo, that's a weird way to go, guy to guy. Like not arm around, yeah. but arm touching. The reach over, yes. The arm touching, not a reach around, a reach over. Reach over. Where he's touching his shoulder in the photo is interesting. The reach over. Maybe a little too much. Also very for posed. Scott Drew. Wh who takes a photo at the beginning of the meal? The 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 menus are still there. That's a very posed. Oh, and this staged. is not a breakfast spot. That's salsa in front yeah, of him. That's yeah, that's a very that's a very staged photo to me. Uh, you, they've just delivered the food, and it's like, hey, take a take a quick photo of this. Let me post it to show I'm in Waco. Scott Drew, uh, who's we're a great here, basketball coach. We are coach. here for only chips and salsa. Scott Drew looks like a man who's never had chips and salsa in his life. Because no. I don't know someone who touches the person they're eating with before eating the chips and salsa. Yeah, That chips and salsa has not been touched. 
And Scott Drew has his left hand on Chad, this man's I shoulder. I can't see from here. Um, is he wearing a Baylor shirt? He is wearing a Baylor okay. shirt in, in the photo. So, but it's untucked, which means he put it on before he walked into the restaurant yep. <laughs> to stage this photo. This was sent at 11.58 a.m. Uh, a man, so lunchtime, lunchtime, right in the middle of it. They're a starting man, their lunch. A man that reaches over for this photo to put the hand on the shoulder has his shirt tucked in. I'm sorry. Well, and, uh, here's I'm going to go ahead and take it a step further. A man who puts his left arm on the shoulder of the president of a big bank that gives you a lot of money for athletics yes. is not leaving the school that he's got the shoulder on the deltoid <laughs> of the man that is going to bankroll him and his program. So I think you could probably cross Scott Drew off the list of, so? of Kentucky candidates. I, I do. I mean, I, you could be surprised, but maybe this is an effort to, uh, to up the, up the offer. Well, up the offer. Who Kentucky. have we not heard be from? A basketball school. We've heard from Nate Oates. We've seen oh. this photo posted. Who's been someone who's very, the loud pit. on social media and with interviews. The pitmaster. Talking about everything from the state of college sports to Israel. The pitmaster. Is Bruce Pearl. Barbecues. Barbecue Bruce. Old barbecue <laughs> Bruce Pearl is oh. remarkably quiet right now. And if I'm Kentucky, I, I said it from the beginning. I don't leave the state of Alabama. I'm hiring either Nate Oates would be my first choice or Bruce Pearl. And you're rating a fellow SEC competitor and you're bringing them to Kentucky. I think Bruce Pearl would crush it at Kentucky. I think he has that similar huge personality to John Calipari. I think Bruce Pearl hates John Calipari. They have a long-standing rivalry going back to Calipari at Memphis and Pearl at Tennessee, where they do not like each other. I think to stick it to Calipari and go to Kentucky and win, even bigger than Calipari has in, yeah. in recent years, would be big for Bruce Pearl. I think that's a good move for Kentucky right now, and Pearl has said nothing. Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio, has this uh, report on said restaurant. We can put the uh, picture back up. Okay. Uh, Holy Bleep called the restaurant he's at right now and told the lady he needs to speak to Scott Drew. Uh, the lady had no idea who that was, so she said he's wearing a uh, he's wearing a white Baylor polo. The lady eventually gives the phone to Scott, and he says, "Hey, coach, we need you here at Kentucky." Scott says, who is this? And whoever called him said, it's just a local UK fan. We need you. And Scott laughs and says, that's impressive, honestly. And then posts this photo. That's pretty good by the Kentucky fan who went that far to do that. Who found Scott Drew in an empty restaurant and called. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Scott Drew's going to leave. I, I, I don't. And I, I don't think that this What's is... A, so, okay. Kentucky's a great job. I just think that there are a lot of great jobs but, out there. And Scott Drew has made that Baylor job one of the greats. This is a this is a massive topic for us to discuss because while Kentucky may not be the greatest job that it was, right? Compared to the fact you can be you can build your own version. The fact that Kentucky just admitted it to John Calipari a year ago. You know what I mean? The, the and again, you you mean about the, not a basketball, basketball school? school. And, and you have the presser, and you, it leads to this. And if I, there is a certain level and a mentality of a Kentucky coach, right? They, we expect them to go get. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see, like, like, like Alabama, who, who the coaches that turned down Bama and who they ended up with uh, may be the greatest thing ever. But the perception is, we, we know that Florida State and Texas kept their coach, right? Yeah. That's, is that the, ba is this well, the basketball Texas, version? Yeah, I think Texas, Oregon kept their coach. I don't think, Oregon. I don't think Norvell was offered. I think they went to DeBoer and Norvell is going to be next, the timing of it. But with Kentucky, the, they've been turned down twice, it looks like. Right. Right now, by definitely Nate Oates and likely Scott Drew. But there's so many good coaches out. I, I've named one in Bruce Pearl. They, I think they could get Bruce Pearl if they went off. What if them. they don't? There's plenty you know I mean? of good basketball coaches out there, and there's so many other ones that could succeed at Kentucky. But okay, are are other coaches also admitting that it's no longer just the basketball mecca? You know, like that's a bigger discussion because it depends on your situation. Yes, and Bruce Pearl could also argue, I'm fine at Auburn. We're going to the tournament every year. I've built my own little brand down here. I've got my own fiefdom in this but arena it, that's it, packed every hey, night in a good atmosphere. It depends on your situation and your ego. Yeah. Pearl's got that. Yes. 